Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. On this edition of Minnesota Original, Terry Guideson is a documentary photographer whose images tell the personal stories of some of Minnesota's most recognizable political figures and celebrities. Every Vietnamese name is like a tattoo. He is a two-time champion of the Minnesota Grand Poetry Slam. Vietnamese-American spoken word artist Bao Phi performs. And the masters of old blues inspired legendary folk guitarist and songwriter Spider John Kerner. These artists and more now on Minnesota Original. For me, there's a difference between a photograph and a picture. A photograph is a snap. A picture is something that really says something that's going to stand the test of time, that people can look at a hundred years from now and learn something from it, or be intrigued by it, or, or, or poses more questions, perhaps. I'm Terry Guideson, and I'm a freelance documentary photographer. The documentary part, for me, has always been the most interesting form of photography. I'm not as much of a director. I like to go into a situation of chaos and find the picture. And I don't set things up I, I, with any of my work. And I've been pretty lucky at finding images that come together and when it looks right, I push the button. The political work, I've always, I've gone for not necessarily the candidate who's going to win, it's, it's more of the passion, you know, sometimes the underdog, sometimes people that I'm, I'm completely have opposite views of. I was just starting my career when, when the opportunity came along to be Jesse Jackson's photographer. It was people's reactions to Jackson, which to me was the most amazing part. There's just so much more that you can learn about a story by looking at the edges rather than the, the central attention. It went from, right from Jackson to Wellstone because a lot, all the Jackson people were working on Paul Wellstone's campaign. I had never heard of Paul Wellstone. A friend of mine had said that, oh yeah, you should, should follow him, you'll probably like him. You know, he doesn't have a chance of winning, but you'll probably like him. And I thought, you know, okay, so, and I did like him. And he was very unusual, you know, going in and hugging everybody, and he was this little guy, and he had all this energy. So he was really interesting. When I heard the news, uh, of his death, I rushed right over to the office and documented that time period. And then shortly after that time, University of Minnesota Press asked me about doing a book, a collection of photographs. The book is definitely an archive of, for me, one of the greatest politicians Minnesota's ever had. I had to go through 12 years of my life looking for what might be the important images. The photo of them that, that's on the cover of the book, I remember the moment very clearly because it was on election day of 96 and it was supposed to be his last time he was going to run. So, you know, it was like, oh, this is going to be the last to run. I was back, there was this platform on the back of the bus and, and we were in Uptown. He was, we, were, we were having a great day. They were driving all through different places. And there was another picture on the same roll that is from the inside of the bus that shows the two of them. I love that picture and that was the one that I always chose. And then it was going through the proof sheets when I was editing for the book that I discovered that one. And it, it you know, right away, I just thought, okay, it's a great moment and it really, captures their energy and spirit probably better than any other photograph I ever made of them. Because I've been photographing politics for so many years, the type of picture I'm, I'm, I'm looking for, sometimes I don't even know, except that I am looking for 
metaphors that speak either about the candidate, the issues at hand. Well, I think it was the Republican convention that year, actually, the year that, what was that, in 92, with, with George Bush, and Pat Buchanan was giving his speech and slamming, you know, the media, slamming liberals, gays and lesbians, and like I fell into all these categories and, and, and people were cheering as he condemned these people. And I'm in the middle of the floor going, oh my God, this is, this is scary. So I, I think maybe one thing I'm trying to do is maybe wake people up a little bit to pay attention and to be involved. I'm most known for the political work, I think probably because of the Wellstone book, but basically I'm a storyteller. And I, I love telling stories. And I've done projects on homeless mothers in transition. I did a project for the History Center on, on, on Minnesota snowbirds. Um, you know, for a while I had a column in City Pages called Terry Guidison's Daybook. And it was a great little thing where every Tuesday I brought a new photo in that was, you opened up page three, it was right there. And it was no cut line, it was just, it had to be a good photo. And I still try to pretend that I have that, you know, just a day book, you know, slice of life pictures. So, I mean, I try to do that a lot of just what's around me, what's in my own backyard, what's, you know, what's on my walk today. I had gotten a phone call from another photographer who had told me that Prince was looking for a photographer. And it's a long story on how the whole thing happened, but I ended up being hired to document his 1992 tour to Europe. And it resulted in a book of photographs called Prince Presents the Sacrifice of Victor. His title, not mine. <laughs> the parts that were most fun was actually the after concert gigs because he'd have the concert and he'd go and jam for two three hours and that's where I made you know some of my my best pictures because then it was a it was a different kind of a thing there was more audience interplay you know you were everything was closer it was very intimate um, you know one of my favorites was after he had just jammed for like 45 minutes on one song at the end and he went down behind stage and just laid back on the floor. And there's almost sort of this religious nature of him stretched out like Christ on the floor in a way. Probably the best part of the experience was seeing what a genius he is, a musical genius. And to be able to have this record of that period of time recorded, again, ties into my whole feeling of like wanting to be a visual historian that leaves a record and you know this is definitely one of Minnesota's greatest artists and, and, and it was a privilege for me to be able to watch him make his music and, and just observe that artistry. idea of what's happened with digital and, and how it's changed photography as an art form and there's this there, there, there's such a need for instantaneous photos and people want them up on this website or on their Facebook and all of that instead of you know just taking the time to look frankly first instead of just shoot 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 look later I, I still prefer an image that can really tell a story that with, within that one image that, that will hold the attention and, and bring that intrigue in and bring the questions in, maybe in some cases bring the horror in to have people take action.
Water in my veins gave my heart in the school library. Never knew her name. Lost my tongue in the sanctuary. Heaven spare me hands raised above my head. Send my brain to the seminary. Never seen. My name is Gustavo Lira. I'm a painter, muralist, and educator. And what is behind me is the Mosaic of the Americas. The mural was built in the year 2001. It was a community participation, including uh, two Mexican masters. What this basically this mural is about is a historical memory about these modern times, the struggle, but also the hopes and dreams for our people. I love the most that it's an example how art can transform communities and improve neighborhoods, can get people together, historians, artists, friends, to get all these people together to create this piece of art. That was an amazing experience. Me says that her family teases her for having thick, round legs like a boy. But really, she is the perfect autumn night sky trapped in a woman's body. When she laughs, you feel night wind blowing through leaves, making them blush and change color. When she laughs, you feel the breath of stars and lunar eclipses under her eyelids. Johnny dances to songs he half understands in English. His hairstyle's like one and a half decades out of style, and you know, maybe that brother should button up his silk shirt just like one or two buttons more. <laughs> but he's just spent 10 hours today at his job, under cars, fixing them up for people who assumed his slant eyes was sabotaging their good old American steel as much as he was fixing them. So who are you to criticize him about what he wears at the club? Viet is, as her name suggests, Vietnamese as hell. 
She only eats Vietnamese food, watches Vietnamese films, speaks fluent Vietnamese, reads Vietnamese literature, hangs out with Vietnamese people, only dates Vietnamese people, and is bisexual so she can be attracted to twice as many Vietnamese people. She drives a Korean car, which is not Vietnamese, but as close as she can get. Hiwi's real name is Hue, and he tells you he may be a descendant of the Wien Kings, but he's all queen, baby, recognize. He's been on his feet all day at his job at the casino, sliding playing cards like ninja stars across green felt tables. And he wants to forget those faces. They could be his father, mother, grandfather, grandmother. Their dreams of fortune crash with the gentle sound of cards flipping onto their bellies. Twee's daddy is a Buddhist, and her mama's a Catholic, and tonight she's holding up a rum and coke and toasting to non-denominational sin, baby. No, she would not like to dance with you, but thank you for asking. She is here in the club to be seen and to chain smoke, like the cigarettes are burning embers, are beacons, paradise dangling just out of reach at the tip of her nose, and her best friend, Vin, who's been in love with her since the fifth grade, sits with her like he does every night. And though he wishes he could be a cigarette filter so he could know the stain of her lips to kiss, he says nothing. He has given up on love, but he's not given up on Long Island iced teas. And so tonight he's here to drink and forget the woman he's secretly in love with. Last name, Wien, all of them. They're not related, but they're more related than any of them will ever know. They sell cars in Orange County. They sell shoes in Queens. They hustle from White Bear Lake to Frogtown, Minnesota. They drawl their way in your heart through Virginia and Texas. They lost everything to Katrina in New Orleans. They fight for their lives every day in Boston. They bake mango cheesecakes in Oakland and San Francisco. Where they live affects how they feel about the weather and whether or not they say yes when you ask them to step out of their front door for some karaoke or late night Chinese food. They sneak bun mi sandwiches into bad movies. And they don't see themselves up on that silver screen enough to wish that they were on them. They gamble too much and they smoke too much and they look great playing billiards and their feet hurt and they've been working all day and they are none of your business. They are one story for every Vietnamese body, one song for every voice that sings. Every Vietnamese name is like a tattoo we all wear, a burst of color we dig deep into our skins. down to earth. I mean, everybody needs paper. Everybody uses paper. I'm Nancy Daly, and I make paper. This is the, whoop, the fiber that was beaten for about 45 minutes. Every part of the process, I think, is amazing the way it changes. My first paper class I took because I thought I was going to be making paper for watercolor, for doing watercolors. But once I got my hands in that lovely gush, uh, they never came out and I didn't go back to watercolor. <laughs> and there it is, Ta da a sheet of paper. It's my own combination, I guess, of Asian paper making and Western style. So this way of doing it appealed to me more, I think partly because it was, it was so old, it was, it's been done this way for 2,000 years. This is the part that I just love. <laughs> so here's a sheet of the plexiglass with the paper that I worked on yesterday. Scratch up a little corner and it just comes right off, voila. That is the finished sheet of paper. It 
is shiny on the one side because I have it on the, the shiny plexiglass. And on this side, it's, it's the, the fiber. And I, I like that combination of shiny and, and uh, matte. And I like, I like the, the translucency of it. It's not transparent, but when you hold it up to a light or to the window, you can tell that there's light coming through. My inspiration is mostly, I would say that it's living on the shore and nature, but, and it is, and it isn't because it's more than just this plot of earth, I guess. It's all, uh, I, I do feel connected to the earth. And that doesn't always show in the things I do, but it's, um, but it's underneath there. I, I, um, I feel grounded when I make paper and when I work with paper. Hmm, maybe that's it. I feel grounded, yes. <laughs>
And of course, these songs are still around because they're, they got some depth to them. Yeah, I've been called an icon and uh, a legend and like that, and it's, it's hard to know what, what they really mean by that, to tell you the truth. I think I understand it a little bit. You know, I've been around for a long time, and I've uh, treated the music with respect and uh, done it well enough so that uh, people appreciate it, and all that's okay with me. Coming soon to Minnesota Original. What makes a successful moving piece? It's something where the experience isn't over, you know, in 10 or 15 seconds. It's something that it takes a while to understand. Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.